Welcome to another episode of A Couple with a Conversationalist. My name is Con. I am the conversationalist and uh, I don't have a coffee. So there you go. There's a shock for you all. Uh, it's late here in the afternoon and uh, uh, I certainly, I've had my caffeine for the day. We know one of the most important aspects of our overall health is the quality of our sleep. And I know for many out there, a good night's sleep is either a distant memory or worse, a fantasy. My guest on today's show is holistic sleep and deep neuro rest scientist, Sabine Cristelli. Sabine also has a Bachelor of Science in Honours, Chemistry, Immunology, and Graduate Research Certificate in Sleep Research. She's an NLP Master Practitioner, Hypnotherapist, and internationally trained, hopefully I'll get this right, Kundalini Yoga Teacher specializing in breathing, but she's taught all aspects of this deep yogic practice for nearly 15 years. Sabine is also a podcaster with her podcast, Sleep Easy. She's a keynote speaker, runs corporate workshops, and is also available for private sessions and consultations. And I'll have all of Sabine's details and social media handles in the show notes. Welcome, Sabine. Thank you so much for having me, Con. I'm excited to share what Whatever questions you ask, whatever wisdom I can squeeze into this episode so everyone can get a better sleep. Thank you very much. Very, very kind of you. Uh, as, as I mentioned uh, earlier, a friend of mine is uh, a, a terrible sleeper and uh, I'm, I'm encouraging her to uh, listen to this episode. But look, before we uh, get into the sleep side of it, what I am interested in, in your uh, details that you sent me, you're currently Director of Sleep and Rejuvenation, partnering with Lux Resort, the Reef House Boutique in sunny Palm Cove. Tell us a little bit about that. That's where I am right now. So that's why the background looks very tropical rather than where I'm from, which is Adelaide, which is really cold right now. So what happened is that, yes, I know, uh, the um, the person that's co-owner in co-ownership uh, wanted to help people to really rejuvenate and relax more deeply. That's why people go to resorts. Mm -hmm. And when he found out I was teaching yoga for them, um, and so he said, wow, you've actually also got a sleep background. At that time, I was doing a PhD on sleep. And he said, tell me more. What do you think we could implement to help people more? Because, you know, he was aware there's a lot of insomnia out there and people who just don't ever rest well. So we talked and he said, I'd like to make that one of the inclusions. So when people come here to really, really relax and it's a luxurious resort, um, they can actually get the most out of it and get some resetting either of their circadian rhythms and their mm. patterns and choose to get an education and some training that they can then use when they leave the resort rather than just this, you know, you go to the resort, you relax, and then you kind of go out and stress up again, and then you have to come back to. So it's more meant to be um, something that weaves out into their life and continues. Yeah, and it's exciting stuff. It's leading edge, actually. And I think it will explode with time because people really need the help. Mm. Fantastic. And yes, I have to comment on your backdrop. Is uh, It is indeed tropical. And uh, <laughs> just for your record, Sabine, I am from Adelaide as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And today is one of the coldest uh, coldest days that I can remember. It is bitter. So I'm, uh, I'm jealous. Goodness me. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. Uh, all no. good. Now, Sabine. Oh, anyway, forget it. I always <laughs> used to think maybe if it gets cold enough, we get snow, which is very beautiful. Occasion. Yeah. Well, look, we, we, we've had a little bit of snow on the Adelaide Hills from time to time, as you as you probably know, but um, not on the flat. Look, um, yes. the, the question that I always ask is I'm always intrigued about people's backgrounds and how does one develop this deep interest uh, and study in in sleep? How did how did that all come about? Yeah, that's um, an interesting story. So my main focus in life has always been to understand how some humans thrive and how others don't. From when I was a child, I used to watch people. So that led me eventually to um, decide to do a degree in science because I thought to be able to understand things, why don't I fi figure out how the biology works? Mm -hmm. What's going on when we digest? What's going on? Why, our, why is our immune system fluctuating in, in how effective it is? And so that was really interesting. So my drive is to help people 
thrive. So that was the idea of finding a cure for cancer, working with the body and the mind. And so from there, I, I continued on to study natural therapies because I realized that in a science perspective, we tend to dissect things and we look for hypotheses and then we we test those. But I personally, that's just me, I found it a bit limiting and unholistic. It was more like, you know, if you want to tune in and learn something about something, you had to go down to the molecular level. And, and then what does that really mean for the person on the street? What does that really mean for you and I? And I found that so interesting, but I'm a very practical person. I, I like to be able to relay things to people mm -hmm. and to actually explore it. And as you might know, when we do research in science, some of that is done on animal models. Some of it is done in a, in a, test tube and some of it is done more on men men or women and it's always a bit of a guess we're never really 100% sure and it's always evolving so when I then continued to find to look to find answers I went to study yoga and realized that when I relax I'm optimized when I relax I remember what's important I naturally let go of my shoulder tension I naturally remember to connect with nature rather than being in that fast forward men mental state of you know studying and getting my work done and just being super on on the treadmill from there, I went on and raised three children, which meant that I wanted to be a conscious parent, which also meant I encountered sleep deprivation. And I realized that my greatest um, downfall was uh, lack of sleep. I could manage my, my mind. I could manage my healthy lifestyle, nutrition, stretching, yogi, you know, all the stuff, the home births, everything that was all easy for me. But I realized the less I got sleep, the more I started to wonder, who am I here? I'm just feeling really almost like my mood changed to um, more depressive. I was obviously having um, an issue with perhaps expressing myself the way I wanted to. I didn't feel as creative. I didn't have as much energy to climb the trees with the kids. And I realized, wow, this is massive. Um how do I get better sleep? And so from there, eventually, years later, I was giving a seminar at university about productivity and using the breath and meditation and actually slowing down to get more done. There was a sleep lab in that university. And I thought, how about we study how to help, how to get sleep onset and duration maintained longer how to get better quality to relax because I my theory was straight away it's people are too wired to be able to get good sleep so long story short um there was a professor there that said hey let's do it just enroll and I thought wow I haven't been to uni in like 20 years let me go back and that was a big learning curve that's good for the brain yeah. <laughs> Did that whole thing, went right back to science and, um, yeah, and did all that research. And, of course, when you're a scientist, you study everything, not just your own mm -hmm. job to, as a PhD student, go into the whole spectrum of sleep. And that's when I decided my biggest passion is to get it out to people now, to teach it and to share it and to remind people of how important it is and the benefits you can get and how it's unique for everybody and the little tweaks that you can do to make a huge difference in your life. And that's where I am now, right now, in a time of massive uh, insomnia and sleeping issues out there. The, it's That is an understatement. The amount of people that I personally know that struggle to to sleep well is is off the charts mm -hmm. and um it, it's it's a major issue and as you said we're just so wired nowadays there's there's so many uh, external stresses there's just so much going on now you mentioned it briefly if we could just talk what is what are some of the absolute obvious benefits from getting a good night's sleep and and regularly as well, by the way. What are some of the benefits? I love your questions because um, I've developed an eight pillar method and the number one pillar that helps people to change is to be really educated on the benefits. I always say it's as if you've got a gold coin and you know it's worth $10, but tomorrow it's going to be worth 100 you would invest in it. Sleep literally will optimize your life tenfold, if not a hundredfold. So there's different analogies I've coined as I teach a lot and they just come out. But in essence, when you get good sleep, you get all the things that you want. I'm going to start listing them so anyone listening can write down and start to really realize the benefits. Just I'm just going to list a few. And then you yeah, can yeah, see. yeah. 
So the first one is increased mental clarity. The second one is better digestion. And they're not in order of science or, or whatever impact. Uh, the third one would be increased mental health, healthier metabolism. A lot of people gain weight due to lack of sleep. Uh, prevention of heart of heart disease, which is linked with it, prevention of Alzheimer's, prevention of problems with uh, diabetes or as in your relationship with insulin, um, aging. So people spend a lot of money, the, the beauty industry for one, trying to stay young. If you get really good sleep and you learn the art of it, because we seem to have learned how not to sleep really well, I've noticed. Um, and if you reverse that and actually give it that time, and energy and give it those little tweaks, you will reverse age and you know, your hormones will be more balanced. Your relationships will be better. You will be less triggered by things, but more present and aware in the choices you make because lack of sleep takes you into fight or flight. And when you're in fight or flight, as you would know, you're reactive. You're not really coming from your best place. You're in survival mode. So la, 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 la. This is just one little download, but uh, it gives you an idea of how massive it is. It's huge. Mm. And, and I just want to remind uh, our audience that you don't need to feverishly take notes because I'll have everything in the show notes and all the links and downloads and everything that Sabine has provided, I'll put those in the show notes for everybody as well. So uh, drive safely while you're listening to the program. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've just thought of another question and uh, it, it's not on my little list here, but I'm, I want, I would love to hear your opinion there's a lot of so-called experts, uh, professional development, business leaders, et cetera, who are big on getting up at 4.30 in the morning, getting up at 5 in the morning, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, five hours sleep is enough, four hours sleep is enough, six hours sleep is enough. Now, mm -hmm. I understand that everybody's different. I get that bit. But in from your perspective, professional perspective, is there a, an advantage and or disadvantage to getting up really early in the morning or letting your body wake up within reason, of course? Mm -hmm. Great question. And I've never been asked this. And it's true. There are these people, these successful entrepreneurs, the 4 a.m. morning, the 5 a.m. club, the mm. All of that stuff. And as you said, and we must um, acknowledge that, yes, some people are designed that way. They are more the early bird chronotype and mm -hmm. they actually thrive more in the morning. Some people are wired to actually be more productive in an afternoon and in the evening. Some people simply are. We have to acknowledge that we can never put ourselves in the same bucket. So some people, remember, some people's poison is some people's, uh, you know, remedy and some people's remedy. Some, it's, it's the same with sleep. So nothing is black and white. People love to have these straightforward answers. But there is a benefit in early morning if you combine it with things. So, for example, if you also go to bed early and make sure that you get, and I, I do not believe that four or five hours are enough from my research, except for one reason. You can make this effective if you meditate a lot, if you're a Zen monk, if you're eating really healthy and you are actually not stressing yourself out. Yes, you will need less sleep and meditation can be deeper in rejuvenation than sleep. So if you say like these people get up at four, maybe they say I can go on five, five sort of hours, which is rare. It's not the normal thing. They would probably meditate. They would probably do their get a massage because they're rich entrepreneurs potentially, or maybe they're lying at the beach and they figured out how to really unwind. But if we don't know how to do that, we generally need an average of eight hours. It's It varies between six and nine. Any other phase around then is either, either supernatural um, benefits of meditation and relaxation or there is something going on that we're ignoring. And we are very good at ignoring. Oh, I mean, yeah. even, even these entrepreneurs, you might look at sometimes they come back 10 years later and say, well, actually, I really burnt out. There are many of them. I won't list them that have gone and said, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. And oh, sorry, I burned out. And then they write a book about their burnout and that they basically ignored their awareness that they did need more rest. 
So mm -hmm. you know, the benefit of AM, if you can take it and you like it and you naturally wire that way, is that it's very still in the morning. It is a very energetically favorable time to have creative thought, um, to perhaps journal, um, to set intentions for your day and to be able to, you know, be in a quiet patch of your neighborhood. It literally is conducive to that kind of thinking, which is more genius flow state. So, but some people need to do that at, at, at eight or nine. It's a lot harder then, but these are the benefits and we have to weigh out what actually matches into our personal sleep health. Mm. Is that kind of get the yeah, answer? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That, I, I believe that in itself is going to be very, very helpful to our listeners. The, the reality is that uh, as entrepreneurs and uh, business people or, you know, managers, leaders, there's always this, uh, perceived pressure that we put on ourselves because we're not getting up at 4.30 in the morning or 5 in the morning. And, you know, for me, I get up at 7 and I'm happy with that. I get up at 7 and I do my routine. I do what I need to do. Uh, and that's a productive day for me. I just, you know, getting up at 4 in the morning just doesn't, just doesn't cut it for me. Uh, so, so that was a really, really helpful response. Thank you. Is it, it it's fair to say that Poor sleep is uh, can be a, as a result of both uh, physiological, but also psychological aspects, mm -hmm. and/or potentially a combination of both. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, just uh, tell us. Yeah, tell us a little bit about each, uh, either, either. So again, that's a nice question. I haven't had that uh, phrased in such a beautiful way. Um, so physiologically, if um, if your body is in pain or you're uncomfortable, or for example, your room is really hot or the temperature isn't cool, we are actually generally sleeping better in cooler rooms. Again, there's exceptions. If you're not properly supported and you're sleeping on pillows that are making your spine twisted or uncomfortable, that creates a physiological stress. And any physiological stress around your bedtime and also your actual sleeping time means that your body doesn't relax fully, which means your sleep is not as deep. So you might be sleeping, but you're not actually getting the deep rest. Mm -hmm. So we can study that when we look at the brain waves and the, how deep the body goes. So just like um, alcohol will suppress deep sleep, so does any sort of stress or physical or physiological tension. And it could be mouth breathing, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's also not safe. The body doesn't feel safe and there could be a stress response. It could be shoulder tension that you are having all night and you're crashing into bed because you're super exhausted. But that actual quality of the sleep you could be getting if you unwound beforehand, is not, you know, you're not receiving it. And now the other question, does that that's the physiology. Now you're also saying the psychology, yes. Mm. So do, do you want to say anything or shall I go into the next? No, thing? no, no, just dead. Yeah, please, okay. you're yeah. the expert. <laughs> I love the exchange as well. Like that. Yeah. So uh, psychologically is huge. And that's where one of my pillars is about what has been your childhood when it comes to sleep, your relationship with your bedroom, your relationship with your capacity to sleep. I meet a lot of people that say, I've never slept well. And I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. So what happened and when did it start? Because no matter what you do, if you have a psychological um kind of experience that's still in the back of your mind in the unconscious which is where that sits this will never let you really relax in bed properly and that's where the psychology has a big impact also if you feel like your partner has dominated the bedroom with their decoration style or the bed sheets or anything like that you are not really enjoying your bedroom the way is ideal and some people do design decide to have separate bedrooms and they meet each other when they want and it probably saves a whole marriage because they have different requirements for feeling good in their bedroom and so that is also a really big one and of course the idea also of the mindset that sleep is really good for you not the old uh, concepts of you can sleep when you're you know dead or when yeah. you're some people wait too long and then they will retire early and they won't enjoy aging because they have suppressed the sleep. So all of those things actually make sleep less valued and therefore less relaxing, less welcomed, and therefore you get less benefits. 
So does that answer that? Uh, indeed, it does. One of uh, look, we, we're uh, inundated with technology. We've got technology. We've got our you know our telephones. We've got our iPads. Uh, Thirty years ago, families had probably one television. Now you go into some homes and they have multiple screens. You know, three, four, five. There's one in every bedroom. There's one in the bathroom. They're just everywhere. Hmm. Personally, I've never had a television in my bedroom, yeah. ever, ever. But I do know people who do have a television. They'll they'll watch movies before they go to bed. And I know people who will watch, you know, their iPads and and uh, computers. You know, they watch a program under the guise of relaxing. You know, just to settle down before they go off to sleep. Tell us about that. That's a very common one, and people don't like to hear what I have to say. I know. <laughs> say that. They also don't want to hear a few other things. But, yeah, sometimes it's more like, look, choose your thing. If you really love the TV and you do everything else well, we can find a way to tweak it. For example, um, after if you do need to watch TV, find out if you can replace that with a good book or make it shorter or check in what is it that you're watching and could you instead do some breathing and connect with your partner even sometimes I feel I say look you guys are watching tv together do you think that when you're on your deathbed you're gonna go yay I wish I did more of that or are you gonna say wow well we could have explored meditation or massaging our each other's hands or feet or our own hands and feet or pressure point release that so that we can sleep better and connect with our inner dimension rather than watching that and then the news comes on and all the other things or Netflix is addictive it's designed that way to keep you going and then you end up going oh man I was up until two and it was so excited and you kind of bond with people over it but what is the price you're paying for that so I always ask people to evaluate how often do you do it what is the price you pay for it are you feeling that it's an addiction and do you want to lose it? Do you want to replace it? And uh, some people are open to that and they say, wow, actually, we've done that for 30 years or 20 years or 10 years. We realize it's not helping with sleep because what happens is when you watch TV and then you just fall asleep during something or afterwards, you haven't given your mind any chance to unwind unless you're watching even David Attenborough will be very emotional. It's it, It'll be all about, you know, what's happening and it's cute. But if it's exciting, if it's working your mind, if it's potentially creating a form of worry or concern, it is not the healthiest way to go to sleep because the brain has to keep processing it. And while you're sleeping there, you might process it and you have dreams about it, the movie, whatever you're watching. And rather than processing your actual life, and finding solutions to problems and maybe finding other ways to be a parent or a business person or just a human, your brain is, is overflowing with all this information, like I said, the news or the Netflix or whatever you're into. And so you're not actually your highest potential. You're actually using your brain or your, what is it called, your, your, your energy and your attention on all the external things which we're not designed to actually all be able to cope with. We're not designed to cope with mm. 20 problems. And then the sleep is shallow. This is the important part. The sleep is not as deep. So people will say, yes, it's my routine and I'm falling asleep. But the sleep is not as quality as it would be if you breathed or had a shower before bed or perhaps wrote down things you're grateful for or perhaps, you know, did some other form of relaxation, a bit of gentle Tai Chi or body stretches. That will, be that will benefit you, like I said, like the gold, 10 times more than this mindless form of, I just watch because it's a distraction from my life. I don't have to think about my problems. I'm watching that movie. But, you know, at night your brain has to deal with it. And the one final thing I want to add as the cherry on top is that if we don't actually switch off at night and we've got too much going on, the glymphatic system, not the lymphatic in the lymph system, but the glymphatic, which is in the brain or around the brain, it has to detox. And it will only detox when you're deep. Because obviously when it's cleansing out, you don't want to feel like I have to wake up, I've got to deal with stuff. So many people are 
I'm guessing the research is not certain and it's always debatable, but because we need to detox and it needs to be a time where we rest deeply, a lot of people have that brain fog and have got that, that way of waking up unrest, refreshed and unrested because that detoxing couldn't happen. So I would now propose, is it worth it, the movie? Is it? Could you watch the movie earlier and then spend another half an hour unwinding in a real way that's really nurturing for good sleep how's what, that what about the science of the impact of uh, actually looking at a screen well, that's- uh, in terms of uh, uh, and correct me if i'm wrong here uh, interrupting our circadian rhythms definitely that i i kind of sort of assumed that mm. that but it's good to highlight it and that is that yes anything with the blue light is disturbing so what happens is that I love this this thing I talk about it at the reef house a lot when I give my talks imagine the reason you and I are here and everyone listening is because our ancestors used to live in the wild so to speak doesn't matter what history you're talking about we also evolved into divine buildings I know we were evolved and we were also very tribal But the concept is that we were in tune with the sun and the circadian rhythm. So in the evening, you would have the campfire or you might have candles to replace that or salt lamps or fairy lights. So and that would let your nervous system know like a program. We still perceive and read the light all the time. It would let you know that, okay, it's evening time, time to re- get re- get out of melatonin, so to speak. Your chemistry or your chemist warehouse inside will do all the right things in response to light, which is one of my pillars that I teach. How is your relationship with light? So getting morning light, getting evening light is great, but and avoiding that blue light off your phone, off the TV. Even right now, I'm I'm here with a ring light. If I do that too late at night, it completely wakes me up and I have to do counter exercises to help my body to unwind again. So, yes, the TV also has that as a problem Mm. to to explain. And that is 100 percent. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. There's a program on television uh, at the moment and I don't watch a lot of television. I put that up there, but um, I do. I am fascinated by uh, by human behavior. Uh, Mm. And the show uh, is called Do You Want to Live Forever? Mm. Uh, and so they've uh, they've got some people they're testing a whole heap of things but but my point here there's a couple on there and they're looking at what their dietary habits are and this couple are consuming or the gentleman is consuming um 15 cups of coffee a day he's consuming 30 cigarettes a day and he's drinking at least six to seven drinks a night. Oh. Uh, and the lady is having a coffee going to bed. Like, you know, some people have hot chocolate. She has yeah. a coffee. Yes. And then they're wondering why they're not sleeping. Are you serious? I'm absolutely serious. I'm absolutely serious. It's on Channel 9. You can stream it. Uh, I swear to God, this is absolutely true. And um, so my, my question here is, we know the effects of caffeine uh, has in terms of of sleep because caffeine uh, is is a stimulant. What are some of the things that people may not be aware of that they're consuming that is having an impact on their on their sleep? We know about coffee, we know about alcohol. Mm-hmm. We know about sugar. yeah mm-hmm. what what other things potentially are people eating or more to the point? How long should it be before your last meal and going to bed? It sounds to me like you researched this a bit because that is one of the key factors that really makes a difference with sleep. So I was going to go right there. So it's obviously personal. It depends on the person, but the further you eat away from sleep, the better. And that's definitely true. I've experimented on it and it shows it and it makes sense. If you have to digest your food while you're also going to sleep, yes, You sleep, but the sleep quality and the digestion quality are both compromised. So ideally, say you want to go to bed at 10, you want to wind down by about eight because it's a two hour process for the body to totally, ideally, you start to look at chilling out for between eight and 10 to have a good deep sleep drive by 10, roughly. This is going to be with variability. Ideally then, if you can, 
if you can finish eating by five or six or seven, the uh, further away from dinner, the better. And also the more the food is sustaining, sustaining, but doesn't cause you indigestion, doesn't cause you, you know, um, problems with digestion, the better. So that is a bit of research for uh, for people that are different and what they like and what kind of diet they use, what is their food. But um, the healthier and the more holistic in terms of pure the food is, the further away from sleep, the better. So often people say, oh, I always eat at nine and I go to bed at 10. I go, it just can, if you just can push it back a little bit to, to towards 8, 30, maybe eight, or maybe sometimes once you start to feel the benefits and you recognize that you wake up feeling better and you're actually absorbing the nutrients of this food, you will probably find ways to actually move that back further and further. I mean, some people finish their last meal at four o'clock and enjoy that. And it's it really helps if, if, you're, if you're able to do it. People that have kids or people that are running a business can't always um, adjust that, but at least we want to aim to do exactly that further away from dinner and that really will help the poor children too sometimes they go swimming and they have a lesson and then they do their homework and then it's like quickly eat dinner and go to bed it doesn't work like that and I'm going to make write a book about this because those kids go under have a lot of stress and they're supposed to somehow fall asleep instantly and no one is designed to do that unless you're so exhausted so I know I see your head shaking you understand yes I could I look we could have a complete other conversation about kids sleep we could have we could have a complete another conversation uh, because there's just some things that i see that i just i just shake my head uh, about um but 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 we won't go there for now um so what other what other and it's interesting you say about having that that break you know from when you have your meal to going to bed Typically, as a rule, I, I'm eating at 5, 5, 30, 6 o'clock at the latest. I'm one of these people. I can't eat late. And it just astounds me how you go, you know, you go out for dinner with friends and they'll go, oh, we've booked for 8, 8.30. I'm thinking, 8.30? By the time we get there, by the time we order our meal, by the time we get it, I'm going to be eating at 9.30. Like, that just doesn't work. And then you've got then you've got Mediterranean countries like Greece, you know, they, they're siesting and then they're going out and they're having dinners and you know, 10, 11 o'clock midnight. I'm going, mate, I, I, I don't know how that works. Huh? Yes, I was going to say that exactly that in the Middle East as well. But they have the siestas and they have different sleeping patterns and they have two mm. waves of, of, of relaxation. So they have a totally different lifestyle than what we have. So that's why there's always an adaptation. Us humans are pretty incredible. Now, you found your groove because you also shared that you sleep well. You found your groove. And this is generally what works for most humans. But yes, if you're living in Greece or maybe in Italy or in the Mediterranean or the Middle East, there are adjustments to that and it seems to work for those people but they do compensate with that from two o'clock to four o'clock rest and they, they shift everything and the whole culture is shifted around that so it works for them yeah mm. absolutely uh, culture uh, culture business everything is is shaped around that that concept of of the siesta um not for too much longer we, we touched on about uh eating and you know when we should have our last meal if you could just maybe touch on a couple of things other than alcohol, uh, coffee and so on, other th other things that we shouldn't perhaps eat before we go to bed. Are, are there any others in there that um, are red flags that people may not necessarily be aware of? Mm, again, I would say just to make sure everyone does trust their own, every, everyone's digestive system is unique in their lifestyle. And also, you know, some people can drink coffee and sleep and other people would never even close their eyes. So I have this respect for individuality and uh, and their own exploration. But as you said, a lot of high sugar, a lot of high carbs, they generally just wire the body up. And then what happens is interestingly enough, um, if we don't exercise after we've eaten, the body will go, oh, hello, we're going to put that down as fat. And we're not getting good sleep anyway. A, a way of compensating for lack of sleep is to crave sweets and, and sugary and fatty foods so that you have energy to run away from the saber-toothed tiger. Mm. 
just an adaptation. So if you're noticing that you're craving a lot of sweets at 10 o'clock or, or the Mars bar or the ice cream or the crackers or the chips, um, notice that and realize this is a symptom of not getting good rest and possibly also not having ideal nutrition, of course. Mm. Um, and so the body will naturally find a way so that you can run away from a threat. So this is really biological and it'll be a strong drive. When it comes to eating, you're talking more, you're wanting to find out things that block people. Well, it's other stimulants, you know, anything that's a stimulant is, okay. is going to be that problem. Like even green tea will be a stimulant, you know, after midday that has to stop. Ideally, if you're going to be strict, yes, yes. Green tea is a stimulant as well. Um, and you could instead have herbal teas and um, other things like um, magnesium rich food or take a magnesium supplement, which really helps. Um, this is one of the big things that I remind people of. Most people don't realize that we are mostly magnesium depleted and there are over 600 biological functions linked with um, magnesium that has to be part of the reaction or the metabolism for that to occur. So a lot of people just taking magnesium, having an Epsom salt foot bath will really help them to relax and can be part of a sleeping pattern. So as much as um, the food situation is complex, I prefer to add things in that people can implement to help them relax and also program them to relax into sleep. And once they get to sleep, you'll have different food alignment as well. You'll end up wanting to eat different foods. You will naturally won't be so tempted with sugary, quick fix, fatty food. So, and also you won't put on fat as a survival mechanism. So it's very, very complex, but also in another way, very simple. If we just look at it as a survival, it all makes sense. Sorry, mm. go ahead. No, no, no. I'm I'm fascinated with the green tea. So my, my question then, I know uh, a lot of people drink chamomile tea. That one's good. Okay, great. Thank goodness for that, because that's something that I've been drinking uh, reasonably late, you know, probably eight, nine o'clock, uh, because yeah. I, you know, just thirst. So chamomile's okay. All right. Okay. All the sedative teas, anything lavenderish, any essential oils, any even peppermint can be stimulating, but it's mostly soothing, helping with mm. digestion and not stimulating. Yes, the chamomile is a number one for sleep. Very good. Oh, mm -hmm. thank goodness for that. And what about they used to talk about a warm milk? Yes. Is well, that it's Warm milk can help. It's got mm -hmm. a tryptophan in it. But again, it's like um, it's not really healthy for everybody. Not everybody wants milk at mm -hmm. night or put on that weight or be needing the milk. The, the best way would be the magnesium foot bath and a hot shower. They both will work for sleep and they won't have any side effects like ooh, addicted to milk or whatever. Yeah. You said about magnesium in terms of uh, a magnesium deficiency. So are we, are you suggesting that magnesium supplements would help as well, other than the magnesium uh, foot baths and so on? Yes, magnesium yeah. supplements, okay. The, okay. the five different types, yes. And they can be a life changer and a major game changer for sleep for some people. Okay. But imagine, imagine being depleted of magnesium, which means your biological functions aren't optimized, which means you're under some form of biological stress. And it and of course, the lack of magnesium doesn't allow your nervous system to wind down as much. You might end up having restless leg and other uh, pain problems. Period pain even will be benefiting from having more magnesium. Mental, you know, jaw tension. So magnesium can make a big difference. Big, big, big. It's a it's a huge topic. Hmm. Just have to say that. And you, okay, we'll just go on from that because I'm I'm fascinated with it now. Magnesium, obviously, I'm sure you can get tested for your levels of magnesium, but is there a problem with taking magnesium supplements uh, potentially if you don't have a magnesium deficiency? I.e., how does your body process? Uh, uh, an excess of magnesium, it, it does it become a problem or is it just processed through the body naturally? It's one of the things, as far as I'm aware, according to my research, that you can't overdose on. Now, I will say, please don't take a bucket full of it. Uh, just take a normal thing. 
meaning it's it's generally got no side effects you flush it out of course the liver uh has to always do that and so really i would always say just take a recommended dose and feel the difference and that's also why um i often say the epsom salt or a salt bath with sea salts in it because externally you can't overdose your body will absorb what it needs it's it's the safest way but mm. internally you, I would take the recommended dose. And yes, it, it has got no known side effects. And uh, as in overdosing, if you already have enough and you take it, it should be fine. But I'm not an expert on knowing what your body does with it. Because when I take magnesium orally, um, I don't get the same benefits as when I have it externally. My body prefers it externally a lot, much different. So it's worth trying both and seeing how you go. Mm. Okay. Uh, and... Uh for the listeners and viewers, none of this is specific medical advice. Please uh, refer to your particular circumstances, uh, and if in doubt, refer to your uh, to your doctor or your your health practitioner. Um, what uh, what do you see as I guess maybe the list? Give me the three main causes that you see of poor sleep. Causes or yeah. outcomes? No, causes. no, causes, causes. So right. what, what is preventing people, the three yeah. main ones that you see? Yes, the main ones are, the biggest one is that overarches everything, is not winding down. Just doing what you're doing and then hitting the pillow. Um, the other one is a lot of wine drinking or stimulants during the day that have simply wired up the person, which is which is just the nervous system is not ready. And the other one would be a, a bedding environment that's not optimized where you're actually not letting yourself enjoy that one third of your life and you haven't optimized it. So even though you might be lying there, the neck doesn't feel good, you can't regulate your temperature, the blanket's too hot, the bedding, what you're wearing isn't letting you breathe. That can be a huge disturbance to sleep. Yeah. Noise, sound, you know, anything to do with how you sleep, it's like a torture. Uh, there is one more. Can I just add that one? Yeah. It's not really so much a cause, but it's the most common thing I hear from people. And that is that people um, wake up at night and then they toss and turn instead of doing the things they can do to remedy that. So if you toss and turn at night, then you're going to have a bad sleep. And that can be actually causing you to have horrible anxiety around sleep. So that anxiety then exacerbates bad sleep. But if you learn how to deal with that wake up, and how to go back to sleep quickly and effectively, that trauma response to waking up and tossing and turning for two and a half hours or whatever it is for people can be alleviated. And that is a huge thing I teach people because it seems that 80% of the people I work with, they can fall asleep, but they wake up and then they absolutely suffer. So, yeah. And then that causes 22. That's why I'm weaving it into that question of yours. It, it would be remiss of me if I didn't ask, uh, and, and I understand perhaps if you don't. Can you can you give us a couple of uh, helpful tips for those people that do wake up and toss and turn to help them get back to sleep? I'm very glad you asked because Thank I think you. people say, don't let her go. Ask her this question. <laughs> she is, is. Okay, so. There are a few things you can do. Now, first of all, you can think, first of all, the most important thing for me is prevent it. Um, prevent it next time by finding a way to unwind more with the shower, with meditation, with a certain breathing. But if you can't prevent it and it's happened to you and you're over it and you need a quick fix, the best thing is, is not to stay lying in bed. After 20 minutes or 25 minutes, it's best to get up and to go vertical to walk around the room, but don't turn on all the lights. Dim. You don't want to have that bright bathroom light waking you up. So actually um, getting up, walking around, maybe sitting down and journaling or doing, I don't know, meditation, breathing, whatever you want to do that's not stimulating. And then after about 10 or so minutes, lie back down. The body goes horizontal a new biochemical mechanism starts as far as we're aware. And that mechanism will start this next sleep cycle for you. So stay relaxed, lie down. If you are worrying, like most people do, 
write down the stuff you worry about and just get it out of your head because otherwise the cycle will continue. So if it's because you're thinking too much and ruminating, it's really important. That's why my background is so holistic. Either they teach you this or they give you that. I bring it together. So you need to do something to get rid of that ruminating pattern. So Distraction is one thing, but it doesn't, it means you have to keep distracting. But if you write down, what am I worried about? What's happening? What can I do about it? And then you write it down, you'll be surprised how your brain will say, okay, this problem, we can nail that tomorrow. We've got some idea. Now it's time to be safe and relax. We are not having a major metaphorical saber tooth tiger coming for us because that's where the programming comes from. You understand, and I can see you nodding. So that makes a huge difference. And so um, don't drink lots of water before bed so you have to get up and disturb your sleep cycle. Do that earlier on. It's all common sense in a weird way, but people are so busy and trying to get through the, the day and night. And um, otherwise, a breathing practice can help. If you're lying down, this is a great tip and you can't go back to sleep. You block the right nostril and breathe through the left. Unless it's blocked, then of course you can't. But breathing through your left will help you to calm down. And if you make the exhale longer than your inhale, it's a stress release breath. So this is how you work your neurology through breath work now. So it is something to play with. It could have you going back to sleep very quickly. I've tried it on so many people now, even in class sitting up, they're almost falling asleep instantly. So blocking the right, breathing through the left, which activates your right brain hemisphere, making that inhale through the nose, exhaling through the nose really slowly the slower the better and notice that that slow exhale the nervous system will then be overridden to believe that it's relaxed it's okay to go to sleep and it will send in all the biochemistry the relaxation and you will be able to go back to sleep again wow good stuff really good we have got everything we need we're the most amazing mm. human we are indeed um, I can hear people out in the audience, Sabine, you don't understand. I've got kids, I've got work, I've got a business, I've got this. Can't I just take a sleeping tablet or go to the chemist and get melatonin over the counter? <laughs> I can hear that too. Number one, melatonin, awesome, helps you with sleep onset. You can do that if you want to, but apparently... If you use it externally, your body stops making it. They found this is the latest science. So the more you use it, it's a bit like if you don't use it, you lose it. So you use the melatonin and it can be a temporary help to reset your circadian rhythm to maybe get out of a traumatic sleeping pattern. But the more you do it, the more you um, block the body from thinking it needs to do it. According to the current research, which could change its mind, sleeping pills, totally nightmare. Like I have written huge articles on that as part of my study. And uh, is uh, sleeping pills are meant to be, again, maximum one week. In an emergency, say you've gone through trauma of a death, moving house, nightmare, something to help you to get some sleep. But every time you take sleeping pills, your sleep quality is reduced. You don't wake up refreshed. You could get addicted. You've got side effects. It's just totally like red flag city. If you can avoid it, please, please do. They're meant to be emergency measures. It's even written that way in the medical field, just like antidepressants. I was really shocked when I did this research that um, it's actually stated in, in the books that even antidepressants are meant to be taken for no longer than six weeks and meant mm. to be a temporary support. So I understand people have kids and they're busy, uh, but even so I would say, and, a, and, and they have a business, but I would say, especially if you have kids, especially if you have a business, spend half an hour here, five minutes there and reset your nervous system because you'll be a better parent. You'll make better business decisions. You will not age and have adrenal fatigue and burnout. And your children will learn a new habit of, hang on, it's eight. Let's dim the lights. Let's do things that relax us. Um, let's look after our body and, and go with the, you know, the natural cycle, which we're so removed from. And you will find your whole environment will shift and you'll be more productive. 
you'll be much more productive. So whatever you're using up on practicing on, on the art of sleep and relaxation, you will get back tenfold minimum because you make less mistakes, you get less sick, you have to pay less doctor bill, you have to be blah, 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 blah. Everything, your genius flow state can open up. And that's why I'm so convinced, confident and passionate that everything you spend on uh, working on the gift of sleep, you will get back a millionfold, literally. Yeah. Really, really. So, yes. Wow. Sabine, uh, as I said earlier, I could talk to you for uh, a lot, lot, lot longer. Uh, and kids is certainly something that I'd love to uh, have a chat about in another in another uh, time. But for now, uh, I just want to thank you for the absolute gold that you have dropped for our uh, our audience. Uh, like we just, at, well, you know, but. There's just so many people out there that struggle with with sleep, and as a consequence, it has an impact on pretty much every other area of their life. And uh, the reliance on uh, um, you know medications and and you know melatonin, and that was something that I wasn't aware of. You know, you keep taking it, and your body stops producing it. Is something that I certainly wasn't aware of. And so there's just the benefits are just ridiculous. Uh, and uh, again, I just want to thank you so, so much for sharing your your knowledge, your wisdom, your expertise uh, with our audience. Oh, it's it's it's. I'm so happy. You know what? Anyone out there who's got a podcast, I don't care if you have a listener of one. I just want to share this. That's what drives me. It makes me happy. My day is fulfilled. So please ask me questions. Take me back for part two and three if you want. I love to share. I believe that, Do you know, I'm just going to add it on at the end because it's really important. I feel like we're so privileged in a first world country. We we can search for information. We can find out how to improve. I feel it's it's our, our gift to be able to share information and not to keep it and to be able to share it. So everyone, including all these teenagers out there and children and parents that are struggling, everyone actually can benefit from all our knowledge and not to even monetize it unless it, you know, some of it is paid for, but I feel it, it makes me feel so good. So thank you, Con, for having me on your amazing podcast. And I really am grateful myself to just. Uh, thank you. This. Thank you so, so much. Uh, and I, I love what you said about, you know, if it helps one person. Uh, and I say this very often uh, to to many of my guests. I don't have an audience of tens of thousands and, and I'm, I don't profess to, but my attitude is this. If one person listens to an episode and it can somehow benefit their lives, then my job's done. Uh, and so I concur exactly what you said, uh, Sabine, and uh, and I really appreciate it. My name is Con. I am the conversationalist. My guest today has been sleep expert Sabine Cristelli. Until next time, my name's Con. Bye for now. <laughs>